On November 8th, the U.S. will hold 475 separate federal elections. If you vote in the U.S., you can vote in at least one of them. The results will determine who controls these, the two houses of Congress. After the 2020 election, Democrats controlled the House of Representatives and the Senate, as well as the presidency, the three bodies that have to align if you want to make new laws. And they did. But even when government is split between the parties, each one of these bodies still holds tremendous power on its own. So the importance of what this picture looks like can't be overstated. And each one of these three outcomes contains a very different story about the next two years in the U.S. Scenario one, Democrats keep both houses. This is not considered the most likely outcome. The Democrats have gotten a ton passed in the last two years. My name's Lee Zhou. I am a politics reporter at Vox. I've been covering the Hill for like over six years now. So if Democrats get to stick with this arrangement, then what? One of the big things they've said they'll do is codify Roe v. Wade into federal law. And that would mean a national protection for access to abortion, paid family leave, subsidies for child care, universal pre-K, the PRO Act, which protects people's ability to organize and unionize. But there's a catch to all this, and it's connected to the reason Democrats haven't done any of it yet. These laws are subject to a rule the Senate has, it's called the filibuster, that requires not 51 out of 100 votes to pass a law, but 60 out of 100. And Democrats want to change that rule. Just not all Democrats. They have this 50-50 very narrow majority, but they only have 48 who are actually down to change the rules. And so they need at least 52 is kind of the magic number that Democrats have been hoping for in order to both change the rules and then pass a lot of the bills that we've talked about. Scenario two, Republicans win the House of Representatives. When the House is controlled by a different party than the presidency or the Senate, that gives them a lot of leverage. My name's Dylan Matthews, I'm a reporter at Fox. They also have a lot of control over investigations. They can run committees, they can subpoena people, they can make people testify, they can dredge up documents. We can see that by going back to the last time the government looked like this. One thing that the GOP majority in, in 2011 and onward did was investigate the Obama administration extensively. The sort of fast and furious uh, gun smuggling scandal on the Benghazi scandal after after those attacks happened in 2012. Easily obtained. Well, but, but Senator, with, with, within hours, if not days. After Democrats won in 2018, they also launched a bunch of investigations into the Trump administration, and, and one of which culminated in the first impeachment. Investigations can matter a lot. More often than not, they're kind of a sideshow. My sense ahead of time is that that lever of power will be less important than the ability to block must-pass legislation on spending and the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling fight in 2011 was, was one of the first stories I covered at the Washington Post. The debt ceiling is this limit on how much the federal government can borrow. Almost the entirety of the international financial system is built on the idea that U.S. Treasury bonds are a safe asset. Once you hit the debt ceiling, they are no longer a low-risk asset. That would lead to investment and borrowing and homes and everything being way more expensive throughout the world, which would be a, a pretty major financial crisis. You need the House and Senate and the President to agree for the debt ceiling to be raised. The, the most dramatic example of that happened in the summer of 2011. The debt ceiling was coming due in early August, and that gave House Speaker John Boehner and members of his caucus incredible leverage. Unless the Obama administration was willing to let the debt ceiling be breached, they kind of had to come to a deal. Ultimately, $2.1 trillion in cuts, the National Parks, Head Start programs, the FBI, National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation. One area of the budget is pandemic prevention. The choice that was made to invest a lot less in preventing pandemics as a part of this deal, um, it certainly couldn't have helped. I mostly expect this Congress to be more hardline in terms of their demands and unwillingness to compromise. Scenario three. Republicans win the House and the Senate. The Senate has to confirm any federal judge. I'm Ian Milheiser. I'm a lawyer, and I cover the Supreme Court for Vox. The president nominates anyone who's going to be appointed to the federal bench, but they don't get the job unless a majority of the Senate votes to confirm that individual. There's a little more than 800 
active judges in the federal system. There are district judges who try cases, court of appeals or circuit judges, and then there's the Supreme Court. The last time we had a Democratic president and a Republican Senate was in 2015 and 2016. Under Barack Obama, the Republican Senate basically hit stop on Supreme Court confirmations and on nearly all Court of Appeals confirmations. And then of course what happened was Republicans held all those seats open until Donald Trump got into office and then filled them with Republicans. Trump's judges overruled Roe v. Wade, which is the reason why abortion is now illegal in many US states. A sweeping reinterpretation of the Second Amendment, our firearms amendment, and now judges are striking down gun laws left and right. A wholesale attack on voting rights, particularly on the Voting Rights Act, which is the law that prevents race discrimination. At the lower court level, we just had three Trump judges declare the entire Consumer Financial Protection Bureau unconstitutional. If Republicans take the Senate, then they can block the confirmation of any judge. If you hold those seats open, they're still vacant when a Republican comes to office and then the Republican can fill them. The Republican Party, which is an institution that wants power, has figured out that if it controls the judiciary, it can gain potentially a permanent veto power over any law that's enacted, over any regulatory policy that's enacted regardless of who controls the White House and regardless of who controls the Congress. They're going after voting rights hard, and if you don't have the right to vote, then you don't have any rights. And eventually, the voters who have been dis disenfranchised don't have any recourse because they have no way to change who controls the government, and the government is controlled by people who, who don't share their interests. So that's the worst case scenario. Right now, we're still at the point where, you know, elections are the best method that can be used in order to reverse, you know, America's democratic decline. Out of the 475 individual House and Senate elections that will decide control of Congress, most of them are not close races. The election will really be decided by these races, only about one out of seven House elections and just a handful of Senate races. And so if you live in one of those places, it means you have a lot of power over which one of these we choose.